Well, uh, my task is to um, bring global warming into this discussion and, um, and also the, the, the fact that um, global warming and the solution to it is tied very tightly to energy use. So this is a kind of a hybrid talk, <laughs> if you will. Uh, and to get right on with it, uh, I'm hoping that, that we'll, we'll get to questions uh, about all this, so I'll just move right through these slides that I've prepared for you. The first thing is that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing rapidly. Um, these lines here are estimates of the rate of increase in carbon dioxide emissions, and they're produced by the IPCC and reported in a paper in, uh, in PNAS last year. Um, the, the lines uh, represent various scenarios of uh, how energy use would work out. And uh, the ones down here at the bottom represent an, in, an annual increase of about 1%, and they go up to an increase of about 2.4%. And then these lines represent the actual tracking of energy use and CO2 emissions by uh, a, part, a department of the Department of Energy and the Energy Information Agency. Their numbers are a little bit different. And along through here, the, the, they follow along pretty well uh, until we get right about here. Since 2006, the rate of increase has uh, exceeded the most pessimistic rates of increase, that, at least pessimistic back in the, in the 90s. And for 2005 and 2006, uh, the increase is really off the line. Now, there are basically two reasons why uh, it's incre these increases are happening. One of them, of course, is that we're using more energy, uh, and much more energy than expected largely in Southeast Asia. But another one is that the biosphere is changing its capacity to take up carbon dioxide. Only something a little less than half of the carbon dioxide that we put up in the atmosphere actually stays there. A little over half of it goes into the biosphere. Uh, some of it goes into the ocean, and some of it goes into the land plants. Uh, and as it happens, what's happening with time is that the ocean, as a sink, is becoming smaller and smaller. It's able to take up less and less. Back in the 90s, it was able to take up about a third of the carbon dioxide we put up in the atmosphere, and now it's much less than that. The land, on the other hand, is more or less keeping its partitioning, which is to say it's gradually taking up more and more with time, uh, as we go along here. The problem with this is that we think that the land is likely to shift into a mode like this in the future because the processes of photosynthesis and respiration are going to get out of balance. As the temperature of the globe warms up, certain parts of the globe are going to start to emit a lot more carbon dioxide, particularly in the north. Above 60 degrees north latitude, there is enough carbon dioxide, enough carbon in the soils to equal the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. If that starts to come out in any significant way, then the, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to accelerate. So we're very concerned about that. For the time being, though, the land is holding its own as a sink for carbon dioxide. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is that the emissions of carbon dioxide from um, energy use are rapidly increasing, largely due to Southeast Asia. China and India now are probably producing more carbon dioxide than we are in the United States, and for sure they will in the future. Uh, this is because, of course, the rapid increase in their, um, in their economies. Now, to give you some sense of what it means to say that the carbon dioxide is increasing and affecting the climate system, uh, we're going to look a little bit at what's going on in the Arctic, because the Arctic is changing more rapidly than the rest of the globe. It's changing more rapidly for several important reasons, not the least of which is the fact that it has a relatively dry atmosphere. And carbon dioxide and water vapor interact in their warming effects. In a dry atmosphere, adding X amount of carbon dioxide has a bigger effect than it does adding that same amount of carbon dioxide in a wet atmosphere. So near the tropics, near, um, near the equator, adding a unit amount of carbon dioxide doesn't warm at nearly as much as it does at the poles. And then there are other feedbacks that begin to get involved, and that has to do with the ice. Um, <clears throat> this line here represents where the ice got to on average for this period from uh, 1979 to uh, 2000. I think that's supposed to be 1970 to 2000. 
Uh, in 2005, the ice retreated to this gray area, and in 2007, to this area. Last year, at a conference here in Washington, I heard some of the uh, scientists who study the ice say that when they went out on the ice to put their instruments there last year to measure the depth of the ice, there was no ice there in places it had been the year before. So the ice is changing rapidly. Here is the trend uh, for this period. You can see that uh, the area covered by the ice uh, in the Arctic is going down. And then in 2007, it's really off the map. And here is the icon of this whole story. Of course, the polar bear who survives on the ice in the wintertime is different from our bears that feed in the summer and sleep in the winter. They feed in the winter and sleep in the summer. But in the wintertime, their food is the ring seal, and it's dependent on the ice. So as the ice goes away, the polar bear suffers. But that's not the only ecosystem on Earth that's really being impacted in a negative way. A negative way for us is that as the ice goes away, that big white reflector that sits atop the globe is getting smaller, which means less of the sun's energy is being reflected and more is being absorbed by the ocean. So while the disappearance of the sea ice in the Arctic doesn't necessarily lead to directly to, to rise <coughs> the sea level, the warming of the ocean because of the lack of a reflector does lead to increasing sea level by just by swelling. If, if the ocean uh, average temperature goes up by one degree, the uh, sea level will come up about a meter. That's one of the factors that leads to increased sea level. So the loss of that big reflector at the top of the globe is a very important factor feeding back onto the climate system. Another one is that at lower latitudes, uh, there are severe droughts now, um, especially in the southwestern United States. You, we've had a 10-year drought which has increased the number of forest fires, and the forest fires put more carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. The big forest fires in uh, Arizona delivered back a lot of carbon dioxide. One of them, one of the smallest ones, put up enough carbon dioxide to equal 150,000 people driving for a year. Another one put up uh, as much as a million people driving for a year. So there are feedbacks here that uh, result from direct effects of CO2 that we can't see so easily, but which all are going in the wrong direction as far as the increase in CO2 and the, uh, and the rise in temperature. And uh, it doesn't look good for the future. The world, uh, world energy outlook in 2007 uh, presents us with this. Um, the, here we are right about here. And for the next uh, 25 years or so, uh, the demand for these fossil fuels is going to increase dramatically, particularly in Southeast Asia, where coal is still the favorite uh, fuel for cooking with, for uh, heating homes, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, in, the oil accounts for a ver the largest fraction of this, and it's going to increase the demand. The demand is going to increase dramatically. Now, what would it look like? What would this lovely earth picture which I'm sure many of you have seen look like if uh, everybody on earth started to use energy as we do. Well, uh, a group in New York, Jesse Osabel's group, has put together a slide just like this to show uh, what uh, this part of the world will look like when, we, when, we, when they use energy the way we do. Incidentally, um, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Um, here is the Mediterranean. You can see this very dense line right around the Mediterranean. Here are the large cities. There's London, Paris, uh, Oslo, Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen here somewhere, uh, Japan, the, the uh, Korean Peninsula. That's South Korea, and there's North Korea. And the rest of the world is pretty dark. But if, if energy demand increases the way we think it's going to increase, I have to back up. Uh, that map would look something like this, with particularly India and China really well lit up. So, um, so the predictions are that energy demand is going to increase dramatically. And that's going to increase CO2. Here is the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. This is from uh, ice cores. Here are direct measurements, and here are predicted measurements. And as we've seen already, the predictions for emissions go above these estimates. Uh, one scientist I talked with last fall said, I think we have to start thinking about uh, getting along with carbon dioxide in our atmosphere greater than 1,000 parts per million. We are now down here under 400. We're down here at about 390 parts per million. Um, uh, 
that's, that's a tripling of the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere uh, over the next 100 years as compared with, say, the change in the CO2 concentration since the last glacial maximum. When there was a lot of ice on Earth, when the glaciers were at their height, the concentration in the atmosphere of CO2 was 180 parts per million. Uh, it started to rise as the ice began to melt. It got up to about 280 parts per million before the um, Industrial Revolution. And then uh, about the time that, uh, of the Civil War in this country, it started to really take off. So CO2 concentration is likely to go up in the atmosphere, and that's going to produce an increase in temperature. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the CO2 that's up there in the atmosphere comes from fossil fuels that we take above from below ground, or whether it comes from the ocean as it degasses as the ice melts and between the ice ages and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, here we have the estimated range of possible temperatures increase uh, based on models uh, during this century. The minimum is about uh, one and a half degrees centigrade. Now keep in mind that between the, between the last glacial maximum and now, the temperature of the globe has actually only come up about five or six degrees centigrade. So in 20,000 years, it's increased about the amount we predict is going to increase in the next 100 years. Um, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the temperature has only come up about seven-tenths of a degree centigrade. Uh, this is what th is being predicted for the future. Now, as, as uh, Yogi Berra said, making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. And these are difficult. This is a big range because there are so many aspects of the uh, changes in our climate system that we have had little experience with that it's very difficult to, to estimate what the actual sensitivity of our climate system is to an increase in carbon dioxide of the levels that we think it's going to increase. So um, we are changing our climate. It's, it's been said that we are the first generation of humans to have an effect on our climate system and the last one to escape its consequences. These effects that, that, that are predicted to occur to our climate system are not likely to affect you and I, especially the you and I's out there that are about my age, but our children and our grandchildren are going to have a world which is very different from the one that we live in now. Um, there is a second reason why it's very important uh, to consider um, energy um, as a part of this whole equation. If we looked at the past uh, for oil, the past record of production of oil, uh, what we see is an, an, in, an ever increasing demand, but an ever increasing supply to keep up with the demand. And the question is, can the supply continue to keep up with demand? Those who say uh, we can, if we take the past as, uh, as, as uh, prologue, sure. We've always found that supply and demand have always kept up. But there are others who study where oil is found, how it's found, and how we have to get it, who say the picture is not that simple. This latter group considers um, oil to be a stock of fixed amount. Um, and in 1956, one of the people working for Shell Oil made a prediction. He said that, that the peak of US production would occur about 1970. His name was Hubbard. And so this peak in oil production was called Hubbard's Peak. Uh, Shell Oil didn't want him to present the paper. They said that it was uh, too alarmist. At the time, the United States was both the world's biggest consumer and producer of oil. But he made the prediction anyway, and it turns out that he missed it only by a couple of years. In fact, uh, US oil production peaked at about 1972, uh, and it's been going down ever since. And as a result, we're no longer the biggest product producer of oil. We're still the biggest consumer, and we now have to import two-thirds of the demand that we have for, for oil. This line represents the increase in demand, an ever-increasing um, slope. And these lines all represent the various uh, capacities for production in different countries. That's the US on the bottom. Here is Europe. Here is Russia. Uh, other. I don't know what other means. And here is the Middle East. Incidentally, in the Middle East, um, the largest reserves are in Saudi Arabia. And our consumption in the United States is equal to or greater than the daily production of Saudi Arabia. Any question about why we're over there? Um, 
So uh, oil, oil is probably going to uh, continue to be available for uh, the foreseeable future, but the supply is probably not going to be able to keep pace with the demand. And as a result, uh, the cost is going to go up. So if the cost is determined by the relationship between supply and demand, then we can expect that the cost of oil is going to rise, and we're already seeing that. The change in the cost of oil over the past four or five years has been greater than the change in any time that I can remember. Um, and it doesn't look very good for the future. So this is another reason why we have to consider um, uh, changing the way we drive our vehicles to deliver the mail. Uh, as far as oil is concerned, Mort Zuckerman uh, in his editorial of August 19, uh, 2006 said, we, we subsidize terrorism. And he had quite a, a lot of figures in, in his talk, in his, uh, um, in his uh, editorial. Uh, here are a couple of them. We're now using oil at the rate of 1,000 barrels per second. In fact, there's a book with this title, 1,000 barrels per second. The cost to us is a billion, billion dollars per day, probably a lot more than that now. That's what we pay to import oil. We don't pay that to uh, all the people that are friendly to us. Uh, many of them are not. This represents uh, uh, a lot of oil, and 70% of it goes for uh, transportation. And that's the subject of tonight. So here, here are what I see as our alternatives to liquid fossil fuels. First of all, conservation. In all the scenarios that I read about, conservation figures very highly in um, our approaches to dealing with the, both the environmental influences of uh, rising CO2 and the cost of fossil fuel for us for transportation. More efficient cars, trucks, and trains. Probably a lot more trains than we have now. Trains are more efficient at moving the freight than our trucks, uh, at least in human terms. Um, the ratio is 35 to 1. It takes 35 more people to move the same amount of, of uh, uh, cargo. I don't know why we have cargo in trucks and we ship things in, no, we ship things in trucks and we have cargo in boats. That, that sort of doesn't make sense. But uh, uh, trains are much more efficient than, than trucks. Uh, probably we'll have to have more trains. Um, so we need more efficient cars. As Amory Levin said, the three quarters of the way to getting here is not by changing the characteristics of the internal combustion engine, but changing our preferences. If we were to drive much smaller cars, we would instantly improve our use of fossil fuels. So conservation is a really big one. And then production of electricity for land transportation. We heard a, a long talk about the use of uh, electric cars in, in, in our past. Uh, and all of the hybrids that we can think about in the future uh, are going to use some form of electricity. Getting electricity uh, from nuclear power plants or from coal with carbon capture and storage are probably ways that we have of dealing with these dual problems of the cost of energy and the cost to our environment. Carbon capture and storage, it means in large power plants, taking the carbon dioxide away, either after you've burned the coal or before, and doing something with it, namely storing it underground. One of the things you might do with it uh, is to feed it to plants. And that's, that's a very interesting solution that some people have come up with. Uh, and that has to do with renewable energy and biofuels. Biofuels are already here in our future, and there are huge problems with them. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about them because I thought nobody else would tonight, so I'll, I'll move right on. And then finally, in the future, uh, hydrogen to run our cars, and uh, especially our trucks, and perhaps very large vehicles. Now, there are quite a few books on hydrogen. Um, probably the, the most pessimistic one is written by Joseph Rahm, at least I'm told by the people who review the subject. Um, and uh, the title is The Hype About Hydrogen. Uh, and it, it's a very good summary of transportation. He was an undersecretary for um, energy at the Department of Energy, and his uh, portfolio was the hydrogen projects. He knows a lot about it, and his book is really excellent. I would encourage anybody who's 